Okay, great. Um, thank you so much uh, to Andre for this uh, really great uh, introduction with the historical perspective and the excitement about where we are right now. Um, uh, I think that was wonderful. And um, he was right that um, what I'm presenting today fits right into it. And um, indeed, I will go just for a few slides into neuroscience foundations uh, we might want to consider at the very beginning. Um, the main presentation, however, is um, about the paper Gender Roles and the Gender Expectation Gaps uh, with two uh, fantastic co-authors, Francesco da Conto and Michael Weber, who are, who are both here. And I'll get to the details of that in, in just two slides. So to start um, with a bigger picture, um, um, you know, a lot of my personal research agenda has been on um, what uh, Stefan Nagel and I have dubbed uh, experience effect. So this um, insight that personal exposure to microfinance realizations appears to shape beliefs and risk attitude for years, if not decades to come. And initially, a lot of this research revolved around major macrofinance shocks. So we have a paper about how the Great Depression affected um, beliefs about stock returns and stock market participation. Uh, then we have a paper about learning from inflation experiences. And a lot of this was, um, you know, like the, the big shock there was the great inflation of the late 1970s, speaking in 1980. And that's um, lots of uh, related work on mortgage choice um, and also international evidence on mortgage market composition, which relates to that. And then um, uh, recently, the, the Journal of International Economics had um, asked us to write a paper about the implications on international capital flows. Um, where we talk about um, concepts such as fickleness and retrenchment being um, very related to the idea that the belief formation of domestic and foreign investors about a certain asset return in one of the countries um, is affected by their differential exposure to what this asset has been doing over the years. And again, revolves around crises like the domestic crises, the foreign crises, um, etc. And um, when I think about wh why that's happening, why as we're living through um, big macrofinance shocks, um, we, we start to think differently and start to shape beliefs differently, um, I've been pushed to, um, uh, you know, try to learn about the neuroscience foundations about of brain plasticity and neuroplasticity, in particular the concept of uh, synaptic tagging. And so the idea here is, as those of you who like me have dabbled a little bit into, into these neuroscience foundations, that as we walk through life and are making experiences, our brains form connections. You know, there's a pre and the post synaptic neuron and, and, and they're talking to each other and basically are telling, you know, our body how to react to what's happening around us. And, and um, these experiences then start governing our view uh, on our lives. We know now that um, you know it's not only the young who form synapses and have brain plasticity, but this is happening uh, throughout life, even though the, the speed may slow down somewhat. And in particular, the literature on trauma, the psychiatric literature, the neuropsychiatric literature, and cognitive science literature are related to traumatic experiences has provided great evidence, um, thanks to, to, to poor rats who are drowning in water uh, in the course of that research, um, a great evidence on how our brain gets literally, literally rewired, how different connections between um, 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 neurons are formed, and also if this happens repeatedly or extendedly, there, um, there might be a stronger and stronger connection between them. So even though the world around us may have changed, we're not in that stressful environment anymore where um, we are in the Great Depression, for example, still the neuron that you know reacts to um, um, getting the news about something with stock market is linked to another neuron, which um, is related to kind of a fearful or pessimistic reaction. Uh, and indeed, um, I do like the connection to trauma. I do think it's an important one. Um, and uh, as a result, my, my econ colleagues have started dubbing my research agenda, Ulrike's work on econ PTSD. And I think, you know, while it's not all about negative stuff, um, I do think um, this is exactly the, the type of literature and the type of science we should start learning more about. Also, um, I do think that the rewiring concept is quite helpful because it helps us to get away from the distinction between you know, educated professionals who know what's going on and the stupid investor on the street who may display certain uh, biases. Sure, they have different knowledge, maybe different cognitive capacities, but all of us get rewired by living through a crisis like the current pandemic, uh, for, for example. Now, um, looping back to the, to the first slide, 
Um, that you know relinks quite links quite directly to big crises such as German hyperinflation or Great Depression, like the pictures I was showing on the on the slide before. But there is not only trauma with a big T. There is also trauma with a small T. There is a type of trauma that evolves that um, emerges from daily exposure, daily worry about things like food prices, potential unemployment, worries about your kids, um, etc. And that indeed is underlying some um, of the recent work um, on, you know, I've worked on SCART consumption with Leslie Shen, but in particular, that's what um, Francesco and, and Michael and um, uh, also Juan Ospina have been uh, uh, leading me to when working on how the daily environment we are placed in, the daily signals we get, if that only happens often enough, will reshape our thinking, these connections between these um, signals we observe and conclusions we draw will become more and more permanent, even if it's not the big type of trauma um, we might be thinking about um, when, when, we, when we hear that word uh, as non-professional. So going into that, going into the, how the daily environment might shape, might shape our belief formation, our view of the world in a, in a lasting manner, um, let's um, dive into um, the gender um, expectations gap and start from some stylized facts, um, which um, you know not specific to the data set I'll be using, but which are specific to um, um, beliefs about future price changes, uh, both short-term, long-term inflation, and I'm also showing here house price inflation across genders. So as it apparently has been known as a, I don't know, secret stylized fact among people working in the Fed or working with this data, for, for decades, there's a persistent significant difference between um, the beliefs of um, females and males. Women tend to have higher expectations, um, whatever horizon and asset you're looking at uh, about future price changes. So they expect higher inflation. They also, um, the expectations also tend to be more volatile. So here, for example, um, using the New York Fed um, survey of consumer expectations from five years, 2013 to 18, um, the average um, difference is around, before we're controlling for anything, around uh, 2%. Um, both genders are upward biased, given that average inflation was actually 1.5%, but you do see the persistent difference between men and women. And um, of course, this is the key variable we want to um, you know, better understand where this difference comes from as you know, real interest rates directly relate to these um, expectations and have uh, inflation expectations have huge implications for important co economic choices, consumption, savings, and some of the variables I mentioned before, um, like uh, mortgage uptake, mortgage markets, uh, et cetera. This is true not only in times of um, when, in the normal times when uh, expectations are well anchored, but it is particularly has been a topic of discussion during times of um, low inflation and low nominal rates because, you know, um, uh, Federal Reserve banks are thinking about how to guide expectations as their key variable to work with with instruments such as unconventional fiscal policy, forward guidance, all sorts of announcements which we hope to use to influence expectations. So we better understand how we can influence them and where they come from. And what we do in this paper is, first of all, we um, re-establish um, the gender expectation gap about um, inflation. In this case, to the best of our knowledge, being the first to show it within the household. So you take a heterosexual household with a male and a female head, and uh, are therefore basically controlling for saving, housing, retirement choices, um, lots of unobservable, and you recoup the gender uh, expectation gap in inflation as, as previewed here. I'm gonna get to that graph also again later. And then the second um, main result, or the main result maybe is to dig into where this comes from. And our hypothesis, as, as you can hopefully gather also from the introduction is that it has to do with the different environment men and women are, are placed into, the different types of price signals a men and women uh, see. And we will be uh, zooming into particular um, who, uh, whose duty is it to do the grocery shopping in the household, and we'll show that the, um, the average gender expectations gap, shown again here on the left, disappears um, if we make here on the very right men and women similar in terms of exposure to prices, in particular grocery prices, and is fully driven by those households where the man doesn't do any type of uh, grocery pricing. 
And I will go into how we relate this to um, grocery prices um, being higher, more volatile, um, and um, how that uh, seems to be influencing um, how women think about uh, the evolution of prices um, more, uh, more broadly. So the plan is um, in the you know like shortened time and we have today to briefly introduce the data, then um, establish the gender expectation gap, uh, establish the role of, of shopping, and then uh, think also a little bit about the different potential channels. Okay, data sources. So our uh, starting data source is the Nielsen Kiel's HomeScan database. Uh, I know many of you have used it. So from the purchase file of this database, we get the quantities and prices of items households purchase at grocery stores at a very fine level, at the UPC level. Um, the trips file tells us you know, when they're doing their trips, how much they're spending on different trips, what the expenditure grows. And there's already quite some demographics from the panelist files. We merged that with um, the expectation and attitude survey uh, run out of Chicago booth. Um, um, this was a customized um, survey with a lot of guidance and influence from Michael and also Frances Francesco about um, um, uh, trying to reach households which are in um, that Nielsen um, um, sample and get them to answer um, a customized survey. Uh, we got to run two waves in June 2015 and, and 16. And basically the emphasis of our survey was on expectations, inflation, interest rates, income, uh, employment. So we're gonna be focusing on the first one today, controlling for the latter one, uh, ones, but there's more to be explored there. Now, in terms of measuring inflation expectations, um, we um, try to be careful to um, ask both about inflation rate as done in the New York Fed survey, and about consumer prices as done in the Michigan Survey of Consumer. As we know by now that um, this can elicit a different responses. We asked in terms of numerical point estimates, both for 12 months and five year uh, yearly in inflation and randomized the two. Um, we also elicited the full probabilistic distribution where you attach a probability way to potential intervals of future, future inflation, which allows us to also calculate um, higher moments um, of the um, inflation expectations. Now, um, we have to acknowledge that many uh, people answering the survey do not understand probabilities. You can try to smooth that sum out, out by the design of you know, what is allowed to answer, but also we are uh, measuring probability literacy, financial literacy in the survey, and we'll be careful to control for that. The full sample amounts to um, about um, out of these 92,511 households in the in the full full sample, the Nielsen sample, amounts to about 43%. That's the response rate we got, about 50,000 uh, individuals. And um, people answering our survey were quite representative. About two thirds were women, um, 53 uh, mean age, um, model income around 80K, and less than a third having a college degree. So if you've worked with Nielsen, um, quite similar to the to the overall sample. Um, here's how we um, establish the first baseline fact. We are basically regressing on top here um, expectation about um, price changes from time t to t plus one. Let's say one year ahead on a bunch of controls in this x uh, vector here. So you see at the bottom standard demographic preferences the financial literacy, numeracy, pluralistic thinking um, type of controls I alluded to earlier. Um, also, um, we uh, calculated a confidence proxy using the standard deviation of the full probabilistic distribution expectations. We're singling here out a, a separate control vector Y uh, because in, and typically we're also controlling for the other expectations we elicited. You can do it with and without, um, there was not much change. And then we have a fixed effect for time, I mean, slash a, a survey wave. And I will show um, later both estimations, um, taking the uh, cross-sectional variation fully and then putting in um, household fixed effects. Here's the first baseline result. Whether we use short-term, long-term or house price inflation, you see that including this whole um, set of controls, you see that um, females um, have significantly higher inflation expectations, uh, which are also highly significant. This is after controlling for quantitative skills, but if you want to dig deeper and uh, restrict to the subsample of who we call geniuses who answer all these uh, financial knowledge questions correctly, you get very similar results. So this is the initial picture expressed uh, in a regression framework. 
Now, um, on top of women having being more pessimistic, expecting higher um, inflation, they also tend to be more uncertain and more volatile um, in their beliefs. So if you put on the left-hand side a rounding to multiples of five as a proxy for uncertainty following you know, uh, Mansky's suggestion, or you just um, use, um, um, you, you just calculate a proxy for volatility based on elicited probability distribution, and otherwise redo the exact same estimation I showed you before um, with a um, full set of controls, you do see that um, women um, score significantly higher um, using either one of the two proxies for uncertainty uh, slash volatility. Um, sorry. Okay. Now, that's the starting fact, but we want to understand where does it come from? Well, we want to contribute to the discussion where this comes from. And to do so, we included in the survey questions about where people get the information from, what are they are thinking about when they, we ask them about infl uh, in inflation expectations. And um, as for the first, um, what their most important sources of inflation expectations are, we um, asked them the survey question, offering them a range of possible choices. Some, as you can see here, uh, revolving around media, newspaper, magazine, radio, TV, social media, other internet, some being other people, colleagues, friends, family, financial advisors, and then we included the prices you see yourself when doing your shopping. And it was quite impressive to see how the own shopping, um, um, the, the, the information gathered from your own shopping experiences absolutely dominates in terms of being the most important um, source of information. So um, the respondents themselves said, um, well, that's, that's what they're basing their, their answers uh, on. Now, if you dig a little bit deeper and ask, well, what exactly are you thinking of? Like what kind of shopping? What, what when, which shopping items come to mind? Um, very much on theme for, um, to, to, for, for this paper, um, uh, women tend to bring up grocery items. So um, you see in red here, the women um, and the top items they bring up being milk, uh, um, uh, well, among grocery, milk, uh, bread, eggs, coffee, uh, et cetera. Men also bring up grocery items with significant frequent, with high frequencies. Uh, although the, the gas one, which we put here in as, as the second one, um, is the most important one for them. Um, but again, for them too, uh, grocery items do matter. You know, I do want to uh, point that out. Typically less than for women, uh, with the one exception of beer here at the end, which is more important to men than, than to women, apparently. Um, now, um, going now into um, how that may translate into the gender expectation gap, we can see here, again, on the left, the general, um, the, uh, the, the overall difference in expectations across all households between males and females, which um, uh, amounts to about um, 0.3 um, to 0.4%, um, um, which, you know, at the current time of very low inflation is, is, is uh, not only statistically significant, but also econo economically very meaningful difference. But the interesting part is here on the right. If we split the sample between um, households where the men, um, you know, maybe more traditional households where the men are not participating in any grocery shopping versus uh, those where the men does at least some grocery shopping, we see that the difference is entirely driven and more than twice as high in the um, households where men don't do any grocery shopping, don't see any, don't see any grocery prices in the, uh, in the shops, while um, it completely disappears in the households where uh, both parts of the couple um, contribute um, to, to this uh, uh, grocery shopping. Um, here um, is um, um, those, those, the, this graphical illustration translated into a regression framework and um, we are showing here both the across household estimation columns one to three and the within household estimation column four to six, as basically just replicating the first three columns with household fixed effects. And we always start by just not thinking about grocery shopping, just kind of, you know, having in the female dummy to say, okay, there was a significant gender effect. Now let's put in, are you a grocery shopper? Well, significant effect, double the size. Um, what happens if you include both? And that's what you saw in the picture before. The gender dummy becomes completely insignificant. Um, it, uh, this uh, result is showing us that the gender difference seems to not be related to innate differences, educational differences we are not controlling for, et cetera, um, which lead to these different views on future price development, 
No, it's the type of price signals you see in your daily life. It's grocery shopping. And the coefficient, I mean, the significance and economic magnitude remains very similar when we put in the household fixed effects to so take away any type of heter unobserved heterogeneity you might imagine between households, you know, that shop at Whole Foods versus kind of lower tier grocery shops, et cetera. Um, uh, you can also run it separately. You can look at the subsample where the women do no groceries, uh, where you don't find a significant effect. Um, they do at least some groceries, significant effect. You can then run the full sample and interact female with uh, doing at least some groceries and you recoup again the same effect. So this is an incredibly robust effect, independent on how you want to cut the, uh, the sample and how you want to uh, pool or not pool uh, um, uh, the data. Now going to, sorry, um, so going to the last part of what channel might be influencing, I might be, well, so we, had, we established the channel of uh, daily price signals you see at a grocery store, but to kind of dig further into what is happening to you, what are you looking at, et cetera, we, while you're doing the grocery shopping, you might ultimately need to run some controlled experiments. But here are some steps forward we were able to do with our data. So. I should again kind of uh, emphasize that grocery shopping is a great candidate to look at as compared to other types of items households may, may buy, um, not only because they are a big chunk of the daily and monthly expenditures in, 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 in every household, grocery prices are also known to be quite volatile. In fact, so volatile that, you know, the, the, the Bureau, BLS takes it out of the core CPI because it would hide the inflation trends because um, grocery prices are so volatile. And we know that when people are faced with volatile, grocer, volatile prices, they tend to anchor on the increase part and neglect a little bit the downcrease part. That's something which uh, in, in our forthcoming um, paper on um, the influence of, of grocery exposure more broadly beyond the gender angle, um, we established, but there's also long previous literature which has established that um, already. So let's say grocery prices are volatile. You, you, what stays in your mind is mostly the, 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 the increase. Um, as a result, that makes you think, whoa, grocery price, groceries are getting more and more expensive. If, if that's the mechanism we are implicitly proposing, then two things should be happening and it should go through the channel of inflation perception. So how we are perceiving current prices to, to have evolved, not just the future prices. The two things are, we should see, if, if grocery pricing makes this difference, we should see it work not only through the answer of, to the question, what do you think prices will be like tomorrow? Also, when I ask you, how much do you think prices have changed right now? What's happening with current prices? They should be upward biased. So an impact on inflation perception, not just future inflation expectations. And once we have established perceptions, there should not be any significant difference between men and women. It's just that they got the wrong impression of what's going on right now. The inflation perception is affected and it maps the same way in, in, in future expectations. So let me say that more slowly, like step by step through the results. Um, if we ask people about uh, inflation perceptions, we replicate pretty much the same picture as with uh, expectations about future price changes. There's a significant gender gap uh, between males, females, even within household that's on the left. And if we, when we split up the sample into those where men do not do any grocery shopping and those where men do grocery shopping, we see that it's entirely driven by the households where the females are doing all the grocery shopping. So it's not only inflation looking in the future, inflation expectations, also perception about current inflation. Once we've elicited the perception and asked how does that map into inflation expectations separately for men and women, so inflation perceptions see on the x-axis, inflation expectations on the y-axis, again in red for women and blue for men, this mapping is completely overlapping. So there's nothing different in your brain structure in how you translate current um, 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 macrofinancial variables, um, changes or growth into expectations about the future, that's happening completely in sync. It's that at the perception uh, stage, men are affected differently from women because of the difference in daily price signals um, they get. So if I summar can summarize all of that into um, kind of a conclusion and an implication slash policy side, a slide, I want to kind of highlight two things. On the kind of summarizing results things, 
um, we hope to convince you with this paper that the long known stylized fact about women having higher inflation expectation than men being a robust fact in the data. Um, it, uh, you see it both in the New York Fed data and in, in the this, uh, this survey, which we merged with the, with the Nielsen data. And it is unlikely to be driven by unobservables because at this point we have been able to establish it within the household with a largely extended battery of demographics beyond the Nielsen ones and controlling for other expectations and other variables which have been unobservables in prior study. Um, the, in terms of what is triggering this, um, gen these gender differences, we are proposing higher exposure to highly volatile grocery prices, which um, affect their perception of what's going on with current prices and then your beliefs about the future. You are over inferring from what you're seeing with grocery prices uh, to general fears about uh, changing price levels applied broadly to you know, nationwide full consumption bundle inflation. Um, in, if we stick these differences into standard economic models of consumption saving, you can see that that might not uh, do women uh, much good. So for example, as we are expecting higher inflation, uh, you know, our standard consumption savings model would say it's not worth it to save so much, to have lower savings, higher spending, might be in a worse financial position in the future um, as a woman when we, if we continue forming um, these biased beliefs. So this is on the um, kind of direct, um, um, you know, economic uh, implication side. If we go a little bit broader, and um, Andre and others brought up that today is, uh, what is it again, International Women's uh, Day, and we want to think about um, uh, implications, well, it's a little complicated, but I think an important insight we are bringing to the table. What we are pointing out is that the daily environment and the daily exposure to certain messaging, to certain price signals you see, really matters for beliefs and, and, and choices. So when we're thinking about the origins of uh, gender differences, of course it is important to remove institutional uh, uh, barriers, but we are saying it's not gonna be sufficient. We also need to generate similar experiences or similar exposures. So where, you know, before we might have thought more of, about policy interventions such as mandating quotas or promoting female uh, participation, well, that's harder to do here, right? You don't want to impose like grocery shopping quotas on, on men and, and women. So we have to think a little bit harder. But, you know, as uncomfortable as it is, um, if, I, if I may just generalize a little bit the insight here to, to broader gender difference debates here, it is important but not sufficient to, for example, when thinking about too few women in STEM, too few women in, in, in finance, to just generate opportunities to, to train women. You know, if you try to translate our insight here, it would be, well, we would need to generate exposure to STEM, the STEM finance world and to seeing STEM female leaders in STEM finance. Um, this will be really important on both sides for, you know, the joiners, the next generation who might want to go into that. Um, but also, you know, for whether male or female, other seniors to see, okay, that can happen. This, 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 um, I used to think about the world in finance as a male one, my brain rewires and uh, kind of thinks about this world differently. Well, how can we do that? You know, that's tricky too. So um, the, the one big insight here is that financial literacy and, and other forms of learned information is not sufficient. We want basically to target economic exposure to price signals uh, of a broader range. I don't know, do the stock market class game um, also in, in female high school and middle schools, um, or um, a little bit more anchored in, in ongoing science, um, the, the labor economics and development economics, which Andre referenced uh, initially, have seen quite a revival on, um, in terms of research on um, the potential effect of role models or the effects of the lack thereof. Um, in, um, in terms of going into different fields. Um, uh, Banerjee and Duflo in their books mentioned spillover effects on female entrepreneurship. And that would be exactly consistent um, with the message in the much more narrow field of, of price expectations we are promoting in this paper. All right, and that's it uh, what I have today. Yeah, okay, great. Thanks so much, Ulrike. So Ileana, uh, the floor is all yours. And I think Ulrike unshared her slides so you can share. Great, I think I can share. Um, can you see my screen? 
Okay, great. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I don't usually get to speak at finance conferences. So even just hearing Andre's uh, uh, introduction, I learned so much. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I know it's often the case that when you do discussant comments, you spend time summarizing. And sometimes that's really useful because I've definitely been at conferences where the discussant summary was like much clearer than the paper, but that's not the case here at all. The paper is super clear. I thought the the, the um, presentation just now was super clear. So I'm not gonna waste any time um, summarizing the paper. I'm gonna make one like tiny comment on the current paper, actually two, because there's one that I came up with during the talk. Um, but the paper's so polished and convincing. I just don't have a lot to say. And I think it's already, you know, in, in the r, &R process that so might not even be very useful. Um, I thought more I would spend some time thinking about some extensions if you were ever interested in um, thinking about uh, going back historically, because there's actually really good historical data on price expectations going back to the 30s even. Um, and then um, this one uh, question about um, how do women, there's a lot of discussion just now about, you know, how do women think about, how do we feed these inflation expectations into, you know, models of savings? Um, you know, what are the implications of these uh, results? And so I wanted to think about the implications of these results on policy preferences. Um, and I think there's actually a bit of a puzzle there that could be really interesting to try to tease out. Okay, so my one like tiny suggestion on the paper is that I think the within household specifications are really nice. Obviously, that's a really clean way just to get rid of a lot of unobserved variation in, you know, the household's financial status. But I wonder, um, I thought you'd use single people a bit more, and you do a little bit indirectly in the New York Fed data. Um, you look at young folks, probably many of whom are, are single, but I would think most single men have to do their own shopping. Um, you know, so I think that you know the single men, if you found large differences between single men and, and um, women in price expectations, you know, that would be a little puzzling. And maybe you've already looked at that and that's just not a particular, it's a short paper, so it didn't make into it, or maybe I missed it. Um, but I thought there was maybe a little overemphasis on the within household stuff. I understand why it's useful. Um, and maybe neglecting of this potentially placebo group of like single men who um, have to do their own shopping. And I think that might even be a little bit superior again, not superior is not the right word, but a nice compliment to the within household to the men shop or not, because you might think that there's just something weird about the married men who have to shop. Like they're just these super egalitarian um, uh, households. Maybe they're women, the female, the, the wives are there, all economists. You could just imagine there's something weird about them because it is against the grain. And again, single men um, kind of have to shop. So there's nothing weird about the single men having to shop. Anyhow, that's my tiny little comment. Um, I thought I, oh, the other comment that I thought of um, during your talk, um, so first of all, I didn't know the fact, I mean, I'm not a finance person, so maybe that's not so embarrassing to admit, um, but I, I thought there were these um, surveys of like experts, and I wonder if there's a, if there's a gender difference even in the survey of experts when they're making inflation forecasts. So I thought that would just be sort of really interesting. If you still found it, that it's such a strong, this is such a robust result, and there might well already be work on that, so, um, so I don't know. Okay, so let me think about the extensions that I, that sort of, ideas that came to me as I was reading the paper. Um, so women's role as shoppers has actually been historically important um, during a certain periods, in particular periods of war, when governments instituted price control. So this is a poster uh, during World War II um, that, you know, women were said, you know, you cannot, you know, do not pay more than the government issued price for these items because there was price uh, controls during the war. Um, and beyond that, you know, women were actually um, hired isn't the right word because they were volunteers, but they were taken in as volunteers. And I think I couldn't find the number this morning, but it's like hundreds of thousands, I thought, in my reading of these like undercover investigators during World War II to make sure like, oh, how much is this? Oh, really? Could I, you really don't have it? Could I pay a little more? And then they would report it back to the government and say, this store is violating um, price controls. So um, it's just sort of an interesting historical perspective. Um, and what's interesting is that there's great historical data on price price uh, expectations. So a lot of us have grown up in this like, you know, great moderation, secular stagnation period. 
where inflation just hasn't been like a huge policy concern, but that's not the case for most of the 20th century. Inflation was a lot higher and more volatile and just more a topic of conversation. So um, Gallup, which is um, in the last few years, they've made all their historical data public and it's now housed at Cornell. Um, it asks all the time, this particular question is almost exactly the same wording, no, do you think that in general prices will be high or lower about the same six months from now? And the first time I've ever seen it, I mean, I didn't look super carefully this morning, was 1937. And it's asked, you know, really frequently after that. So I just took a, um, a survey that I had cleaned up uh, that happened to have the inflation question. This is from 1950. And yes, uh, consistent with the hypothesis, if you look carefully, um, a larger share of men are likely to say that prices will go lower. Um, and so even here, and I'm guessing that's significant, it's about a seven point difference. You see this you know, fact emerge in this random 1950 survey. So looking at this historical data, it's just kind of fun, but beyond that, I think it allows a more, potentially a more demanding test of your mechanism because there were moments in history where the prices that men would anchor their expectations to were more volatile and particularly the seventies during the uh, you know, during the, you know, um, huge volatility in gas prices. So um, you show, and it's, you know, makes total sense that uh, men are more likely to think about gas prices. Um, it's probably especially true in the historical period when men were more likely to drive than women and more likely to commute for work. So I would guess that's even more the case in this like 1970s period. So you could look in this, you know, period, you know, here I just um, took the Fred, took some Fred data and, uh, you know, obviously not surprising to anyone who knows that history, you know, the most volatile period for gas prices, you know, was during the 70s. And so you could see if the men in the Gallup data um, have that, you know, sort of an anomalous point, you know, higher inflation expectations than women. So that would be, I think, a pretty demanding test of the theory. Okay, so the other um, extension I thought of, and that's where I think there's a bit of a puzzle, is that if women expect higher prices, should they be more concerned about inflation? And they're not. So like, um, you know, as far as I can tell, you know, you can just take a, a recent example, you know, Janet Yellen is the dove, Larry Summers is writing papers about, we should be concerned about inflation. And there's been, you know, um, a, you know co um, commentary about who's right. Um, so traditionally, politically and economic conservatives have been more concerned about inflation. Um, in the modern era, women are not conservative um, politically in rich democracies. That's not always been the case. You know, going back a little bit further, uh, women have been more conservative. Um, so again, the history could be interesting there. Um, of course, there's nothing to say that there, these things are in conflict. I think they're just a little bit of a puzzle to tease out. So women could expect higher inflation, but two other things could be going on, which is they don't think it's bad. That's totally possible. Yeah, I think prices are gonna are gonna increase, but look, they're always increasing. I'm going to the grocery store and I see price changes all the time and we all live through it. Um, or they could not connect inflation to like interventionist economic policies, which are tended to be, you know, favored more by liberals. So by left wing, um, by people, people on the left wing. So just one quick example. Um, this is just a, a super recent survey about the stimulus that Biden is, um, you know, it looks like is about to pass. This was taken from February, so not quite clear if he was going to pass it yet. And, you know, it's not a huge difference, but women are, are definitely like, yes, yeah, stimulate the economy, which, you know, generally tends to lead to higher inflation. I mean, this is very popular among everybody, but slightly more popular among women. Um, more to the point, the general social survey not frequently, but over three years that I've been able to find, they just ask, hey, okay, if the government has to choose between one or the other, what's more important, keeping unemployment low or keeping inflation low? And this is a big difference. Like, you know, um, women are much more likely to say, no, you've got to combat unemployment. Um, and it made me think that, you know, prices and grocery shopping are not the only thing that women experience more of. And as you alluded to, I mean, childcare is like one of the most gendered tasks. So you know, perhaps they balance this information about prices with like firsthand information about what unemployment might do to their household, or they're just more attuned to those, you know, types of concerns. But um, there is a bit of a, clearly something must be, um, you know, they think inflation is going to be higher, but they don't care, or they don't connect, um, or they don't care because they think that, you know, what inflation buys you is actually more important, which is low unemployment. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that there's been, you know, there's some previous work that we've done 
that sort of found something similar that, you know, you can tell people about the shape of the income distribution. They're like, yeah, inequality is bad, but then they don't necessarily support policies that would combat inequality. So again, it's not, um, this is in no way sort of like questioning the underlying premise. It's just more trying to think about um, what the implications are. Um, so you could imagine, you know, a survey experiment that asked people about COVID stimulus and sort of varied whether you prime inflation concerns. And it'd be interesting if you didn't find the gender results because, you know, women think inflation is, is high or will be high, but they don't necessarily think that's a problem. And I think that's all I have to say. Oh, the other thing I was going to say that's especially, um, this is just came to me as you were speaking, um, you know, if these higher inflation expectations reduce savings for women, that's like doubly concerning because women live longer. And so there's, you know, uh, that just seems like, and even if that's the case, that's a really um, big concern given, you know, longevity differences. So that's all I had. Again, thank you for including me. Um, it was a really interesting paper. I learned a lot. I didn't even know the basic fact, much less, you know, all the robustness that you show. And um, uh, again, like it's, uh, it's really nice to be um, at a conference where I don't normally, uh, you know, uh, know all the contributors. So thank you. Thanks so much, Eliana, uh, for discussing Enrique. And Enrique, if you want to uh, give answers or like uh, uh, respond to some of the stuff that Eliana said before we go to Q&A. Um, this is, yeah, just super briefly. This is super great and such a constructive uh, discussion, uh, Eliana. There are like tons of research ideas and, uh, and Francesco and Michael, def I definitely want to keep working. So pointing us to the historical data, um, contrasting more survey of experts and individuals, which I've done in other contexts, but like here we haven't thought oh, about great. it. Like really, really great suggestions in and with concrete identification, like gas price spikes, <laughs> instruments are already ready for us to go. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you, you were right on some of the other remarks. For example, we had also looked at, at single people and just, you know, we were just restricted to bringing the new thing to, um, to the table, but I agree with you, um, that could be quite convincing. And um, I just want to say one more thing on the like policy implication. Um, you know, you, you're right. So like a lot of things are then a little counterintuitive if you just take our result and then go back to the standard model. Yeah. Even the thing that then women would be under saving and over consuming, I take with a grain of salt because often these, these expectations are maybe connected to some general worry and then go in the other way. So right. a lot of things don't work out from here on, but that doesn't mean um, we shouldn't study it. And so, for example, the link to the policies, um, men versus women support is super interesting. I like your hypothesis that the woman is just so used to like price increases that she doesn't worry anymore. Alternatively, it could also be, you know, she sees the Fed and the policymakers announce we do this and that and going to stop inflation, say in past times, and she looks at her grocery prices, nothing <laughs> is happening. So she yeah. just doesn't believe in the link to policy, right? right. And so it would be super interesting uh, to study that. So thanks for giving us so much uh, food for thought. Uh, and I'll stop it here. I don't know whether my co-authors have thoughts uh, they want to contribute. And I have to admit, I wasn't able to follow the chat, but happy to answer questions as, as they are, of course. Yeah. Um, OK, great. So uh, we're going to now go to questions. Everybody, please. I um, mean, we have some questions from Q&A from during the talk. And beyond that, we're going to go to chat and ask questions, hands raised. So please feel free to raise your hands. So the first question is from Neil Stoughton uh, from Arizona. Neil? You should be unmuted. OK. Uh, you just unmuted me. Um, thanks. I uh, just wanted to ask a question. You know, the uh, I happen to be uh, in a household, and, uh, and I also go to the grocery store. And I, I noticed there's this high-low pricing strategy that is followed by most of the standard chains, not Walmart, where prices are ordinarily high. And then once a month, they get dropped for a week or so. And of course, it's on different products at different times. And that would seem to add a lot of noise and confusion to the process. And I wonder, you know, how do people filter through that? Are they able to see, see those things and, you know, and, and overcome that limitation? Because it would seem to me to make ascertaining inflation, inflationary increases, for example, more difficult. Um, yeah, th that's a that's a great question, and um, so um, I have a half answer for you, and uh, may maybe my co-authors have to say more. So, in terms of these types of um, 
price setting schemes existing. There being temporary increases, decreases in prices, um, the sales, uh, promotions, etc. cetera. Uh, what we did uh, in particular was in the companion paper is to make sure our results are not in any way driven or obscured or exacerbated by those. So it's, it's easy to identify them and identify which stores do it and don't do it as, as you said, and then say, let's take uh, that data out or let's restrict data um, and um, kind of make sure our results hold. So, um, so, so our results seem to be independent of those, which doesn't mean that you are not right, that this is a little confusing and might be, um, I mean, there might be had some heterogeneity in what this does to different um, sets of uh, consumers. Uh, that's something, um, I, I, we haven't studied, haven't thought about. I don't know whether Francesco or Michael, anything comes to, to your minds. Um. Maybe just briefly to add to, uh, to Neil's comment that the fact that um, those uh, price changes, if they happen, tend to be actually the uh, price cuts more temporary. And so like it could indeed lead to uh, maybe more confusion on the uh, part of, uh, of households or individuals. So um, what we tended to see, uh, so we looked at like, you know, is it a temporary versus a permanent price change? At least in this companion paper, we could mention it didn't actually play a role. But of course, we totally agree that it could be interesting to understand like whether you observe many temporary things that you get even more confused in what the overall price trend is. But uh, at least for this baseline uh, association between past uh, observed price changes, inflation expectations, it didn't seem to, to actually in fact play a role. Um, okay, great. So the next question is from Janet Gao uh, from Indiana. Uh, Janet, you should be unmuted. Hi, um, I, I think my uh, question is more of a comment. Um, I, I, was, I thought it was very interesting to see that people in the same household um, do not converge in their expectations. So um, I wonder, like, what's what is the channel underneath? Maybe personal experiences are just so much stronger than people telling you what what is happening to the prices. And uh, I was asking whether um, this type of differences or or the lack of convergence also manifests in other types of ex expectations and not not just inflation. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's something we always struggle with in, in, in behavioral finance economics more broadly. Like, come on, you can have these beliefs for a while, but why on earth are you not converging? And you're saying even within household, right? Yeah. Um, but I, th I think you gave the answer we would give um, that we just think that this kind of daily exposure and the resulting, you know, synopsis that keep being formed, oh, another price increase, another price <laughs> increase. I mean, your, your brain gets rewired. And that this is just over, we know it's overwhelming learned information um, and it might overwhelm, you know, what, what, your, what your partner uh, thinks, thinks and says, you can't help but go to that. Which um, by the way, um, it, I think um, it doesn't necessarily mean like if I give you then a math test or like or some kind of econ test that you wouldn't be able to say, oh, consumption expansion on grocery is just the third, so overall inflation wouldn't be so strongly affected, but just that's where you, your brain goes to. So what can mm -hmm. you do to undo it? Well, on our conclusion side, implication side, put the people into different environment. I'm not saying you're stuck there, right? But you just change, need to change the environment and then these um, things will revert um, is, is our view. It has to be, um, you know, as MBA teachers, many of us, it has to be experiential learning for, for it to really have an effect. Hmm. Interesting, thank you. Um, okay, great. So the next question is from Jonathan Zandberg from BU. Jonathan, you should be uh, unmuted. Uh, yeah, no, my, my answers were, uh, my questions were answered by Francesco. Thank you very much in the chat. Uh, okay, so the next question is actually from Valentin, uh, uh, from UCLA. So, Valentin. Hi, yeah, this is really great. I, I guess I think you, you already talked a little bit about this with, um, with Ileana, but I was curious, those like steady state differences in belief, like the fact that there's like, you know, 6% versus 12% all the time. It's hard to, I guess I, it's hard to see how it's gonna map into different actions in steady state in a way that is, ultimately I have no clue how to map 4% to 6% to what should be my optimal consumption, except from experience as well. And so it seems like they should do the same thing. But, so I don't know if you have more to add about this. And, and it seems like clearly for like 
when things change, then they will have different men and women can have different reactions. But for the steady state, do you have any idea how it matters or it, is there any evidence about that? No way. So just to make sure I fully understood the question, you are saying like both men and women are significantly upward biased, as we saw in the New York Fed survey with like the six and four percent, for example, in the beginning. Given these high numbers, you think that for both men and women, it's unclear how to map that into any um, economic decision making kind of model? Or no, no. So what I'm saying, even the difference between men and women to be four percent versus six percent, like. It doesn't really tell me that women should consume more or less or so on, because mm -hmm. the way they map this expectation to optimal action is probably through experience as well. So, they, you know, their life cycle consumption okay. and everything would be the same if they do the same thing, irrespective of what's their anchor in a way of like 6% or 4% or even the real number of 2%. Oh, this is a really cool point. So you are saying you're taking our, our work one step further and you're saying, okay, you're showing this with like the price beliefs. It applies to other stuff. So in the past, I've learned that expecting 6% price increases, I proceed as follows with my shopping and that tends to work out well. And so we need to like apply this kind of experience-based learning there as well. Yeah, no, I'm fully on board with you. <laughs> um, that's right. So maybe we should just drop that, that bullet point of like under the standard Euler equation, this and that would happen. We should just drop it because, I mean, at least the three of us have bought into different forces affecting beliefs and resulting decision making anyhow. Um, if you're asking me to make it, you know, operational, I think there's still some way to go. So some more people like you have to get into that and think more about like how to transform our consumption savings models. Yeah, but very good point. Thank you. No, thank you. Okay, for uh... yeah, I don't know if we can briefly add also something to the to to Rika's answer very briefly. So with some work, for instance, I mean we we have uh, with micro and unconventional fiscal policy. I mean I think as uh, Valentin was mentioning earlier, it's exactly maybe in the times in which we do observe change that these differences are important. And so that's exactly I, I think kind of the a bit of the bottom line of these policy implications in the sense that whenever you think about these policies that like unconventional fiscal policy, which would be announcing changes in VAT that will only be implemented in the future, that's exactly when having different levels uh, of uh, uh, expectations in prices will, uh, as, as yourself and you were suggesting, uh, uh, predict different uh, uh, reaction to that form of policy. And so that's exactly, for instance, what we, we see in some of that work explains different distributional effects of these policies, potential redistribution between in this case, men and women, given the different levels of uh, inflation exclusions they have at the beginning, as well as uh, you know, potential increases in inequality and whatever, what not, because these policies were actually implemented in a sort of representative agent framework, where whereas instead different uh, genders will react differently. So these would be probably, I think, situations as, as you were mentioning. So whenever we think there is a change, for instance, policy induced that, that would where this difference in levels will matter more. Okay, excellent. So uh, for our last question, we want to again ask Ileana uh, to ask her question. <laughs> so this is asking you to go far beyond what's in your paper, but I was so intrigued by the uh, motivation in your talk about sort of these generational scarring. And I'm just curious what you think uh, will be the effect of COVID. It's certainly some of the most bizarre year that most of us have lived through. And it's like akin to a great, I think kind of like a great depression, acute disruption. And so just based on your past work on sort of these uh, trauma, um, how would you guess it plays out regardless of like inflation or not, but just uh, more generally? This is an excellent question. And um, you know, my, my, I think my, my first answer is working mothers who have three little boys at home will be most traumatized and need forever very strong support. But uh, more, more seriously, um, I, so I don't have the full answer for you, but I think I can like say a few things it will not be. So what has emerged from, I mean, the, the research I've been showing today, but then also some of the more longer lasting experience effect analyses is that these effects tend to be very domain specific. So it, it might be related also to what in memory, I think in some of Andre's work on, and Jessica Wachter's work is called like context specificity. Um, but the idea that we, you know, we are generally scarred now and therefore generally more risk averse or something, that doesn't seem to be true. It seems to be quite connected to specific 
um, um, markets or arenas of life, etc. So concretely, um, while say um, the financial crisis um, made a lot of people shy away from stock market savings for like years and decades uh, to come, stock market investment as a form of accumulating wealth. Well, at least here in the US, I mean, it's differently different in Spain and some other countries, but like here in the US, well, stock market has been fine. So one prediction on, on would be, well, we have to look very specifically at what you know arenas were affected. So on the financial side, which is the emphasis of much of this um, type of workshop, um, maybe not so much. You know, maybe if anything, you know, Robin Hood is trending on Twitter. We all sorts of people got in, involved in in stock market tra uh, trading. It goes into a counterintuitive direction. Don't think any crisis means risk aversion to anything. So that's one thing I can say. Then the next thing I would say is, yeah, like rather than having a broad brush um, um, conclusion in terms of um, types of educational choices and job choices people will make, I think more than ever, it will be important to look at the huge inequality you are emphasizing and heterogeneity in the impact this has had on your earnings and on job loss, et cetera. So some people have been doing quite well. And so there, maybe they continue on their path, their kids continue on similar paths as they would have um, otherwise in terms of college and, and job choices. But if instead your father had this small, you know, corner store or your mom was running also kind of some local business which was shut down, that um, those are the people where we would expect kind of the highest um, um, scarring effects to occur. And then I think even though I tended to emphasize uh, in the, uh, yeah, emphasize in the initial neuro slides that um, our brain plasticity, you know, it's just always there. We don't believe anymore. It's just the little kids who's, who, you know, where, where the, the neurons and, and the synapses are evolving. It's definitely highest the younger you are. And there's this long labor literature that talks about graduating into recession. That applies here. And I'm quite fearful that we should be thinking about younger generations right now. The kids who saw their world turned upside down by not seeing their friends, uh, having very different type of learning, retraining their brain to early at the early age of whatever, eight or younger to multitask and watch YouTube videos in the background while the teacher is trying to explain. Well, I mean, I do, I do quite worry that uh, we have been rewiring um, all of these people. Um, so, so it's a little general and imprecise, but I'm in, indeed asking myself a lot who will be Gen COVID um, um, from a perspective of five years out.